be here. Very nice to have this invitation. It's great to be talking to people who have a like interest here and uh, an interest that uh, I have been pursuing for a number of years now, basically since 2005. Uh, 2005, I received an email from a farmer in Nebraska that said that his new farming techniques, which were the adoption of herbicide tolerant crops, were eliminating milkweed from his landscape and he was therefore eliminating monarchs from his landscape. Uh, that just uh, sent a shiver down my spine, and ever since I have been dedicating myself and my organization to doing something about habitat restoration. All right, my talk today has, has a title that refers to an incident that happened uh, right at the beginning of getting together with uh, the stakeholders uh, at the White House in 2014. As you may recall, the population really crashed in 2013, the winter 2013-14. Uh, the White House immediately got together with various people in the, um, uh, the science community and they decided that they had to do something about monarch butterflies and they had to bring all the stakeholders together with the concern about monarchs and pollinators because the pollinators were part of the issue as well. And the very first thing we heard when we walked into that room is that this is a big problem. We're going to save this monarch migration. It's all hands on deck. All hands on deck. They realized at the very outset that this is going to be a major problem to create enough habitat to sustain this migration. We're not worried about sustaining the species, but we're worried about sustaining the migration. So it, just to re-familiarize you with what's going on, the migration involves a year-long trek from the overwintering sites in central Mexico, where they are right now, but coming up in the spring, the butterflies will be on the move at the end of this month or the first few days of March. They will move into Texas approximately uh, the 12th of March or so, a few days earlier or a few days later, but that's the average time that they get to the milkweed areas in Texas. Then they spread northward uh, into that green area that you see there, and in that green area, that's where the returning butterflies lay most of their eggs. Now, how far they spread into that green area is often determined by temperatures. I'll explain as we go along. but the, the fact is that most of those butterflies are dead by the 1st of May in most years, and that's their limit. Those offspring from those eggs that are laid by those returning monarchs then move north in May and June, uh, the, especially the first 10 days of June. And when they colonize, colonize that northern area is extremely important. And then you've got the summer conditions that we have to worry about. So uh, as you go through this whole process, you see the first generation or the, the, the returning migrants coming north in that green area, the, their offspring going north to the limits of milkweed. And then about the end of the first week of August up at Winnipeg, the migration starts all over again and moves south. So you've got about a two and a half month process taking the butterflies back Mexico. So I divide this whole thing up into stages in order to understand the whole process. And so I'm developing a stage specific model and it allows me to understand a little bit about how this thing is going. And one of the things that Iris wanted me to do is to kind of cast some light on what's happening right now, uh, give you some background as to why we're here talking about monarchs, that is, uh, what were the consequences of that email that I got from that farmer in Nebraska in the larger sense and other things that have been happening. And then also uh, to uh, talk about what might be done, and that's why you're all here, to talk about uh, habitat restoration. I'll give you a few uh, things that I've been working on along those lines. And uh, then she wanted me to remind you again about the listing and this, the CCAA, and that'll, that'll come through with this talk. All right, as you see over there on the right, we have 6.05 hectares of butterflies this year. 
Now, this was not a surprise to me. I was predicting that the population would be very good this year from as early as March. And the further we got into the season, the more I was secure that the population was going to be very large this summer. And I've been telling everybody it was going to be over five hectares, and it was. I mean, it's really hard to predict precisely how big is the population is going to be, but um, I can predict the general trends. And the reason I'm predicting the general trends is we've got a nice long 20-year record now where we can look at uh, things that are happening in these different stages that I mentioned. And because we can look at these different stages and we compare years, we can see what's positive and what's negative. Now, most of the time when we put things together, it looks like a bunch of broken sticks. So what you're looking at there is over there at the left, you're looking at the conditions in the south uh, early in the spring, in March and April. Then you're looking at what happens in, the, in May, in the middle of that, and then you're looking at what happens in the summer. So that's the broken stick sort of thing that I look at all the time. And I'm trying to figure out in, among these broken sticks just what is it that makes sense? How can I predict a population uh, in terms of whether it's going to grow or not? Now, I don't know if you can see it here, but there are three straight lines in that, or nearly straight lines in that group, and this is where the population has increased. So what happened this year is that we had positive, positive, positive in terms of three stages. We had positive conditions in the first stage as the butterflies were coming into Texas. We had positive conditions in May as the butterflies were moving north, that first generation moving north, and then we had positive conditions in the summer months. So basically we had a straight line. We didn't have a broken stick this year, and that's why we got uh, this great number. This, these were the best conditions. As I looked at all the conditions over all the years that we've been looking at this, these are the best conditions since 2001. And when I really looked at it in detail, they were even better than 2001. So that means that what we saw this year is really not normal. It's not average. It's exceptional because it, this is the first time in you know 17 years or that we had 18 years that we'd seen anything like this. And if the next nearest thing was uh, something that we'd seen in 2008. Well, here that sums it all up. They came into Texas at the right time and in good numbers. Uh, then they, uh, the March temperatures were very favorable, and but it was cold in North Texas. They couldn't get out of Texas. They couldn't get out of Texas because it was too cold in Texas. And that made me uh, realize that what was going on was that they were laying almost all of their eggs in Texas. And I'm going, yeah, lay those eggs in Texas, because if you lay those eggs in Texas, that means that your developmental time for the larvae is going to be really short. That means the age to first reproduction for the population is going to be short. That means that you're going to send a big cohort out of Texas going north, and that's exactly what they did. Egg laying was largely limited to Texas, and then you had a large number of first-generation butterflies coming north. And the May temperatures were just ideal for these butterflies to move into the uh, upper Midwest, uh, that is north of 40, which would be north of St. Louis, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. Uh, that's where most of the butterflies come out of uh, uh, to uh, produce the fall generation. So the recolonization was really good, and it was at the right time. So again, timing and numbers are really important for how this population functions. And then the summer temperatures were pretty much ideal. They were two degrees above normal. Two degrees above normal is kind of the upper limit. Maybe two and a half degrees above normal is kind of the upper, uh, upper limit for population growth. If it gets hotter than that, if it gets warmer than that, then the population tends to decline. So there's a certain positive benefit for being above normal in terms of summer temperatures, uh, but it can be too hot, as it was in 2012. Uh, you can uh, be also be too cold, as it was in 2004. But the summer conditions this year were just perfect. So the bottom line is that we had nearly optimal conditions. We had nearly a straight stick in terms of uh, this population growth. All right, so uh, is this going to continue? No, it's not. And if you look at what's been happening in all of the years that we've been looking at uh, the monarchs, uh, we've had 11 years out of 19 years since 2000. Uh, where the temperature has been above normal in Texas in March. That, that tends to propel those butterflies too far north too soon. And if we look at the long-term projection for Texas, it's supposed to be much hotter in Texas in March and April uh, than it is at present. So it's uh, probably going to be about six degrees above normal, and uh, that's six degrees Fahrenheit above normal, and that's average. 
And uh, numbers, monarch numbers have declined eight out of 10 years in which the March temperatures have been uh, above normal by uh, almost two degrees. But the March in the monarch numbers have increased in the four years in which the March temperatures have been below normal. So actually below normal has the effect of doing what happened in 2018. It keeps the eggs in Texas. So anything that can restrict that egg distribution, keep it down in Texas, southern Oklahoma, that's favorable for population growth. All right, so that gives you an idea of what happened there this year, but it also tells you that going forward, we can't expect to see a big population like this again, maybe not for another decade, maybe not ever, because things are changing really rapidly. But we have to keep in mind a couple of other things, and this I harp on this all of the time. That is, we're losing grassland, which is milkweed habitat, and we're losing CRP conversion to cropland at a rate of about a million acres a year, maybe more. And then we're losing development in this monarch uh, milkweed corridor uh, at a rate of about a million acres or more a year as well. My question to you is, are we replacing that much habitat? Because if we're not replacing that much habitat, we are losing ground on a yearly basis. That's something to think about because we've got to do, we've got to run as fast as we can to keep up with that. Um, it goes back to Alice in Wonderland, doesn't it? Red Queen says to Alice, if you want to stay in one place, you have to run as fast as you can. That's what we're at. We have to run as fast as we can to keep this migration going. Those are, those are my placeholders to tell me I'm changing subjects here. So why are monarchs declining? Let's get to where we are and the basis for why we're here today. GMOs, glyphosate tolerant corn and soy. Those were the big things that drove this population uh, starting in the late 1990s. The economics associated with biofuels are a big part of this as well, and people tend to forget that. So we had a tremendous conversion of rangeland and grassland to croplands for biofuels. Uh, we've had development that is really hard to measure, but it's somewhere over a million acres a year, maybe up to two million acres a year, depending upon how inclusive you want to be. Uh, we've had an intensification of agriculture that's reduced field margins. We've often had uh, um, section roads eliminated in some places as farms have gotten bigger. Uh, so we're, we're losing habitat in a lot of different ways. And uh, as far as management of our marginal lands are concerned, we are intensively managing a lot of those lands with herbicides. That's not a good thing. Insecticides, we're losing a little, little bit to... Uh, insecticides as well for mosquito control. We have degradation of the overwintering habitats in Mexico that's certainly having an impact. And we have unfavorable conditions during the breeding season that is increasingly going to marginalize this species. So this is what fields used to look like. This is a picture I probably took in 2004 before this, this farmer adopted uh, herbicide tolerant uh, soybeans. Pictures like this were all over the place. You've got people all over the Midwest who hate milkweeds because their parents sent them out to chop milkweeds in midsummer, trying to get them out of their field, which was a, a, a thankless task. All right, this is the first figure that we published on this sort of thing, showing the relationship between the adoption rate of herbicide-tolerant plants and the decline in monarch numbers. This is still somewhat controversial as a cause and effect sort of relationship, uh, but it's a very plausible one, and we now have more evidence to indicate that this is actually uh, what happened. But I don't have time to get into it. Uh, we have, uh, uh, subsequent to the adoption of the Renewable Fuel Standard, uh, we have a tremendous change in the landscape due to the development of cropland uh, for the production of corn. And uh, uh, Lark and his associates at the University of Wisconsin showed that 77% of 24 million acres that were converted at that time uh, in the four years after the renewable fuel standard was signed by President Bush in 2007. Uh, uh, that's an area the size of the state of Indiana. The, the tremendous habitat conversion that took place at that time uh, was mostly in grasslands. And that, of course, is a monarch and pollinator and ground nesting bird and pheasant and quail habitat. So this, this was a tremendous loss of habitat in a, in a four-year span. All right, this shows you that these blue graded areas show where that grassland was cannibalized for production, in this case, of grain. 
So basically the grain production moved out of the upper Midwest and moved off into the grasslands. And, and you can see this, these two white lines here, they describe the area for which most monarchs are produced that get to Mexico. So this is a, a core area that we're talking about, this milkweed monarch uh, corridor. All right, if summarize this all up, I'm not gonna, you don't have to look at all of these details. I'm gonna give you a bottom line here. 2014, we had 29.5 million more acres of corn and soybeans than in uh, uh, 1996, before the adoption of those uh, herbicide tolerant crops and before the renewable fuel standard was established. So the habitat conversion, uh, as I said, from 2008 to 2012, amounted to about 24 million acres. Uh, that happened so fast that it, 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 people just didn't realize what was going on. That, that's an amazing rate of conversion in a very short time. Uh, it took several years to catch up with what was going on there. So the total habitat loss to monarch butterflies, pollinators, ground nesting birds, your pheasants, your quail, and so on and so forth, uh, all of those organisms that share those habitats, you're, you're probably talking close to 160, 170 million acres about the size of the area of Texas. Wow, all right, changing subjects again. What do we have to do? You've all seen this picture. All of our introduced grasses are very shallow rooted. We're facing droughts coming forward. We know there are gonna be droughts, climate change is gonna happen, and the droughts are gonna be severe. What gives you resistance to droughts? Deep rooted plants. We've gotta get more deep rooted plants out there. We have to get a lot more native plants out there, some of which have roots that go down to 20 feet. And they will remain green, they will remain more fire resistant than a lot of the stuff that we've got out there now. Uh, I've worked in, been working in Oklahoma for the last five years. They had a three year drought look just before I started working there and you couldn't see cattle anywhere. Nobody had any cattle anymore. The drought had eliminated all the hay, all the hay production, uh, all the forage. Uh, there was nothing out there in the fields, it was all brown and everybody sold off their cattle. Now they've had three years of rain and the cattle are coming back. But this is what we're gonna see in the future. We're gonna see these uh, extended droughts, two, three, four, five years. And in order to resist those droughts, we've gotta have more native plants in the ground. So we've been working with tribes in Oklahoma to get more plants in the ground. And our concept is, is perhaps different from anything that you've been adopting or thinking about we have a patch model, and the patch model is uh, what we're doing is we're creating little islands. Uh, we don't have enough money to uh, restore 50 acres here and 50 acres there. We're working with seven tribes. So what we're doing is we're looking at the land that they allow us to restore, and we're creating little islands. And then we're going back, and you see a whole bunch of islands there. And these islands are, you've got site preparation. You go out there and you nuke them with uh, glyphosate and remedy, and basically you kill everything that's in there, and then you go in there and plant them with plugs. And it, we put the plugs in, and then we use a clean straw to mulch the plugs. We, re, uh, we uh, water those plugs uh, three times. Um, and what we're doing is we're creating little habitats, little islands that are rich with forbs and milkweeds. And the idea is at the end of the year that the whole area is mowed, and we spread those seeds. In other words, we open things up. So we use a little investment to get a long-term benefit by spreading those seeds out with those little habitat islands because we don't have the resources to go to do more than that. We don't have the resources to seed large areas. And the seed is hard to get. There's almost no seed for Eastern Oklahoma, by the way, uh, for native plants. And then you always look for proof of concept. Boy, we had proof of concept right away when we started working with the tribes. These milkweeds, these milkweeds were planted just the summer before, and uh, <laughs> they came up the following spring, and boy, they were just hammered by the monarchs. That's what you want. You want proof of concept of anything that you're doing, all right? We had it immediately. All right, changing subjects again. Let's talk about this. Um, I wrote something about creating a monarch highway, and a lot of you, because I was in, into this right away thing for a, a while, long time. I can't tell you why this was posted at 4.22 a.m., but that's what it was, all right? All right. So it was a proposal to create a monarch highway. I, I do wake up in the middle of the night and do strange things, yes. Okay, um, so the idea was that we should use our right-of-ways 
uh, particularly I-35, as a signature way to uh, show that we need to maintain the integrity of the system that uh, supports monarchs, pollinators, and supports us. All right, and this shows I-35. It's the iconic highway that mimics this uh, milkweed monarch corridor that I've been talking about. And so you all know I-35. Well, we've done a few things on I-35, but I've got to tell you that three years and a couple of months after I wrote this, we still haven't done a lot on I-35, not as much as I would like. Here we are restoring uh, habitats at a rest stop. Uh, we put in two of these plots that I'm talking about, a uh, rest stop near Guthrie, Oklahoma, come in there with uh, augers. Uh, you've got to have augers to do this sort of thing if you're working with plugs. You get these steel augers and you get one or two of these augers going and you can uh, put these holes in the ground really fast. You can keep a whole bunch of people planting uh, the plants uh, pretty fast. And uh, you can put these really diverse sites together uh, fairly rapidly with a bunch of volunteers. All right. And then after the plants are put in the ground, we're using all those forbs, then we overseed it with side oats gramma and blue gramma. And the idea here is to create something that is very uh, diverse and very thick, all right? And it's supposed to look like this uh, so that you don't have to have any maintenance to speak of. All right, proof of concept. We had proof of concept before we even put these plants in the ground at this site. We had all of these plants that we were gonna put in the ground, some of them were in flowers. We had pollinators all over them before we even got them in the ground. And we were in a kind of a sea of grass and <laughs> and forbs were really rare, and boy, the pollinators just sucked into these plants just as we put them in the ground. So my concept here is that creating a monarch highway will strongly communicate the need to maintain the integrity of the system that supports monarchs, pollinators, and other species uh, sharing these habitats. And this is the sign that uh, the uh, dots have adopted. This is uh, uh, one of two plots that I know of on I-35 that was created by KDOT, the Kansas Department of, of uh, Transportation. Uh, one or two more things to tell you about. This is our Monarch Way Station program um, and tell you about this. This is something I started in 2005 because of that Nebraska farmer. Uh, we now have over 22,000 registered sites. And I was surprised when I put this together. I asked Jim, my assistant, about this. He said, you know, we've got sites in six countries outside the U.S. What? Really? We're international? Wow. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Uh, and it shows you the kind of distribution we have, but it's even more than that. This was actually in 2015. Um, so you can put all sorts of signage out in these places, and the signage can educate people really well. And we have a big Bring Back the Monarchs program. I'll tell you about that very briefly, my amount of time, but I'm going to go just a little bit longer. And the Bring Back the Monarchs program is basically a habitat restoration program by which we distribute milkweeds that are uh, mostly underwritten by various benefactors, uh, corporations, NGOs, and so on and so forth. Uh, they have provided us with money that allows us to distribute plants uh, for restoration projects. We work with four nurseries around the country. We are rapidly approaching the distribution of almost a million plugs since this program started. Uh, this is what the plugs look like uh, at this, uh, this time of the planting. They're about two, two and a half months old. We have a very high survival rate of these plants if they're probably, probably, uh, properly planted and watered. Uh, one more uh, bit of things to tell you about. Yes, and I'm going to wrap it up here. Monarch, fly, monarch butterfly recovery plan. So what should be involved? What do we have to think of? I put these slides together a long time ago, and maybe you guys have been thinking about all of these things. You should be thinking about all of these things. Uh, we need to increase the production of milkweeds, forbs, and grass seeds for restoration projects. There's, there's a real question as to whether we have enough seed out there. Uh, we need the development of regional seed mixes, and uh, that's going to be part of your discussion here today. Identification of potential restoration sites, that's certainly on the table here. Development of outreach to educate landowners, uh, that a number of people are talking about that sort of thing. And boots on the ground, we've got to have a lot of boots on the ground, and you've got to have money, of course. So uh, these are all things to discuss, as well as implementation. Uh, we need a management plan. And one of the interesting things for me is that we don't have any overarching management plan. We have a lot of people doing their own thing, but we have no grand plan or grand vision. 
Uh, we don't have any marketing and outreach. Marketing in particular is not part of our discussion here, at least for the most part it isn't. And if we want to get, if we want to really engage the American public, we're going to have to market this, right? We're going to really have to market it. And, uh, well, I, I guess I'm going to skip on here because I think you understand all of these things here, but let me just make a little pitch again for this, this outcome that I think we need to think about. Uh, we have a short-term goal outcome that we have to deal with, and that is we have to replace about a million, two million acres of landscape a year based on the rate of change that's occurring in this country. And then we have a long-term goal, and that long-term goal identified in this all-hands-on-deck sort of discussion, a paper that has also been produced that has this title in it, um, that we need to add 1.4 billion, billion stems to get the monarch population back to an average of about six hectares uh, per year. And then we have to talk about sustainability because these milkweeds don't sustain themselves. We're going to need help. So we're going to have to have long-term management of these plots that we create, whether it's fried seeds or plugs. All right, we need a vision. Um, the monarch migration can be saved if there is commitment to offset those annual losses. If we are committed to developing the capacity to get the job done. And we need a multiplier effect. And this is where the outreach and the marketing come to effect. We need those things that convince the public and the benefactors uh, that we have proof of concept that this thing works. So we get a good multiplier effect here uh, so that we can generate the support that we need to get this job done. We can't do it alone. We're going to have to have a lot of out, outside support. All right, last topic, Endangered Species Act and Monarchs. I told uh, Iris that, uh, really, you want me to talk about this? You've got experts here. But anyway, I'm not going to say anything about this except to remind you that, we, that what's going to happen here is that in June, uh, there's going to be a decision uh, as to whether the monarch should be declared threatened or a species of concern. If it's a species of concern, no regulation is required. If monarchs are declared threatened, then the CCAA really becomes important. And the fact is that you've got a plan for the CCAA in advance of that decision. And that's part of what your discussion is going to be here today. Well, with that, I'm going to close with this picture from my friend Pete Brokelson. This is a sunset setting on one of Pete's uh, very nice restoration patches with a nice monarch watch uh, uh, sign there. And I guess my last message is don't let the sun set on the migration of the monarch butterfly. Thank you very much. <laughs>